Now the next thing I hear, no scientific evidence whatsoever that vitamins have anything to do with human health. Well, let's look at the facts. We are here in Amsterdam. Not so far away is the University of Utrecht here. In 1929, there was a teacher, academic teacher there, Christian Eichmann, and he received the Nobel Prize for his work on vitamin B1. Just like that. You can go to the internet, to the Nobel Prize Committee, and you can check that out 80 years later. It must have been important, because otherwise this would have disappeared. And of course it was enormously important. We'll hear from him further on. Eight years later, another Nobel Prize on vitamin C. Albert Sanchergi, a Hungarian scientist, not just for the discovery of vitamin C, but for its role in the metabolism of cells. And I'm, we are being attacked as unscientific? Do you understand that there must be a group, there must be a lobby that is disturbing, distorting the truth, that is suppressing this information? In total, in the first half of the 20th century, there were nine Nobel Prizes being awarded to vitamin researchers for the establishment of the role of vitamins in the human body and the role in optimum health, providing optimum health. Nine Nobel Prizes, and we're being accused of being unscientific. Come on. Of course, there were other vitamin researchers that uh, did not get a Nobel Prize in vitamin research, but carried on this important work. One of them was Linus Pauling. He had, no, he had Nobel Prizes in chemistry and in peace, but he was probably most known for his work on vitamin C later on. I was privileged to work with this man for a few years. And what we did when we developed this concept, he died in 1994, and when we decided to continue this work, it was important that we say, well, we're not working just with one vitamin. We're trying to find out what is the synergy of certain vitamins for certain cells under normal conditions to prevent diseases and for certain health problems. So if the uh, disease has already uh, taken place, to correct it. So it's like dealing with a single solo performer uh, on a violin or piano or an orchestra. And cellular medicine for us is finding out, fine-tuning the orchestras, not just for individual people, but for certain diseases. Understanding which of the micronutrients you need more in certain conditions. I can tell you it's very exciting because what we notice it, if you do that, you can lower the amounts of the individual micronutrients dramatically and still have the effect. Synergy means you have a mutual impact. One micronutrient has a, an impact on the other and increases its value in the human body. And of course the other thing we do with what we understand under cellular medicine is applying this knowledge of basic biology into medicine which is not the case today. So here that slide summarizes the advantages of what we call cellular medicine. The business sector, we talked about that, is healthcare. The strategic goal is the prevention of diseases. The target is cells. The treatment principles is here in the pharma-oriented medicine, suppressing the symptoms in cellular medicine, correcting the root cause at the cellular level. If you stay at the organs, you have no chance to treat the root cause of diseases because they are lower than the organ. And of course, the economic consequences, we've talked about that already. Cellular medicine and cancer. Why cancer is no longer a death sentence. 
When I started this work on cancer, well, maybe one step further. When I studied medicine in Germany, it was clear that cancer is a death verdict. The only thing that you wanted to know is which form of cancer gives you a few years more to live. But all of them were deadly. So what we learned was essentially which, which cancer is especially malignant. So it's short prognostic time, which, is, which cancer is a little more benign, which gives you a little bit more time to live. Questions were not asked. Facts were not taught that are so simple that you, when I'm telling you that, will never forget it for the rest of your life. For example, why is it that certain organs of our body are more affected than others with cancer? For example, in women, the breast, the ovaries, the uterus, in men, the prostate, testicles. Why in general is it that the reproductive organs of our body are more susceptible to cancer. More than half of all cancers occur in those organs. Why is that? Why is it that we have, so in children and in adolescents, why we have frequently bone cancer? Why don't they have heart cancer or kidney cancer? Well, some of it, or for that, for that matter, skin cancer as frequent forms of cancer, these, these kids. Why is it bone cancer? Why is leukemia the most frequent form of blood cancer? When I, I assume there are a few medical students here, when I was in medical school, we were told God takes a little uh, browse and goes over this planet and uh, the liquid, wherever that liquid falls, cancer arises. It may be your skin, it may be your liver, it may be your bladder. Well, I've never heard of heart cancer. It occurs, but it's so, so rare that it's essentially unknown. So something is wrong with this teaching. And of course, if you're not asking the right questions about a disease, you should not be surprised that this disease will never find its root cause. And you will never find the reason why this disease is in, exists in epidemic proportions, not only in Amsterdam, but around the world. So one of the things that we have to understand is that the fact that 50,000 men and women in the Netherlands alone are dying of this disease has something to do with medicine and pharmaceutical industry not asking the right questions and not wanting to know the truth because they don't want this disease to disappear. Cellular medicine, this is our first cancer patient, 70-year-old patient in Germany, lung cancer, typical x-ray. Here, this spot is magnified. This is the tumor in the lung. After seven months on the cellular health program, he goes back to his doctor and uh, the control x-ray is being made. And the doctor says, well, Mr. Pilniuk, I think you ought to come back next Monday. Our x-ray machine seems to be kaput. <laughs> she didn't say, what did you do? She didn't say, whatever you did, go on, it seems to work. She said, it can't be. I've never seen it. And of course, he came back and the apparat was still kaput. <laughs> that was seven years ago and, you know, he's still very active. He said, you know, I own you my life and I'm continuing to work with spreading this word. <laughs> 